The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, my name is Kelly Tebow, and I am with the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders. I will be your organizer for this evening and would like to welcome you to our webinar on Selective Mutism, Coordinated Behavioral Approaches for Therapists, Parents, and Schools. Thank you all for joining us. All participants are muted. If you have a question, please type it in the bottom of your question box and click the send button. You may post a question during the webinar, but Dr. Chu will be answering questions only at the end of his presentation. We will get to as many questions as time allows. In addition, tonight's presenter is available to take your questions on the Wednesday webinar discussion board. This discussion board will be monitored for the next seven days. Feel free to look and post questions as often as you like. Answers will be archived for future reference. If you missed part of the presentation or would just like to hear it again, an archived version will be posted to the website shortly. When you exit the webinar, there will be a brief exit survey that we would like you to fill out. New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, NJCTS, and its directors and employees assume no responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, objectivity, or usefulness of the information presented on our site. We do not endorse any recommendation or opinion made by any member or physician, nor do we advocate for any treatment. You are responsible for your own medical decisions. Now, I'm going to turn over the introduction of our speaker to Martha Butterfield, the program coordinator of NJCTS. Marty? Kelly, thank you, and welcome to everyone joining us for tonight's webinar. It's with pleasure that I welcome back Dr. Brian Chu to our Wednesday webinar series. For those of you who are new to our webinar series, Dr. Chu presented a webinar for us in the spring of 2010 on the topic of school refusal. It's archived on our website and available for download for those of you who are interested in the topic. And I'm, I might add at this point that it's one of our most frequently downloaded webinars in our series. Well, he's back again tonight to speak about selective mutism. Dr. Chu, a New Jersey native, received his undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania and his PhD from Temple University. He is assistant professor in the Department of Clinical Psychology in the Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology and assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Rutgers University. He is also director and founder of the Youth Anxiety and Depression Clinic which is a university-based research clinic that provides evidence-based assessment and treatment for children and adolescents. His expertise includes assessment, treatment, and dissemination of evidence-based treatment to schools and community clinics. Dr. Chu, welcome. Okay, we were hearing you earlier, Dr. Chu. I'm sorry, I had it on mute. <laughs> I just, uh, what you meant was uh, thank uh, I'm sorry, let me, there, now I have you on uh, full phone. And I'm sorry for that, uh, for the technical difficulties. And uh, what you missed was my thanking Marty for that uh, lovely introduction as well for, for to Kelly for um, the flawless up to this point uh, technical assistance. And I also want to thank uh, Faith and the New Jersey Center for Tourette's Syndrome for having me back. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting on the roles that therapists, families, and schools can play in addressing selective mutism. Um, as a way of introduction, um, this is the Youth Anxiety and Depression Clinic that's located on Rutgers University at the New Brunswick campus in New Jersey. Um, for anyone that there's the contact information if you'd like some further consultation or if you'd like to refer um, uh, kids to us or families. Selective mutism itself affects um, estimated small amounts of children and adolescents, but it's very impactful so that when we do come across these children, um, they, they um, deserve a lot of notice. They typically identify between the ages of 5 and 10 years old, but the signs are um, often apparent much earlier. It's just that we don't notice them until they start to increase their social contacts and go to places like school. It does affect um, girls slightly more than boys, and we see it in both genders. As far as this uh, specific and, and uh, DSM criteria that we use to diagnose this problem, it's defined by a persistent failure to speak in specific social situations where speaking is expected despite the ability and the actual uh, typical behavior of speaking in other situations, hence this 
idea of it being selective mutism. And there has to be a significant interference across social or academic um, achievements so that it's actually interfering with their behavior. It's been there for a little while, so it's not just during the first month of school where the, most uh, children might be a little bit nervous. And it's not due s exclusively to the lack of language um, uh, or knowledge or comfort, um, for example, if, if uh, children are speaking a second language, or by uh, exclusively by some sort of communication or learning disorder. Just to give you an idea, a flavor about the types of um, uh, behaviors that these kids exhibit, um, one of the uh, girls that we saw here, a seven-year-old girl, extremely anxious in social situations, wouldn't speak to classmates, but it whispers to adults. She refused to talk during our introductory interview while her younger sister, who was three years old, served as the mediator. She would whisper to, the, um, to her sister um, you know, an answer to one of our questions, and the three-year-old girl would speak very audibly and comfortably um, answering for her sister. Her academic grades were good, so there wasn't an issue of a learning disability. Um, but gym and music and other classes that required active participation um, grades were poor. Um, she wouldn't ask for help when needed, and she clinged to her parents um, consistently in, in just about any social situations. Uh, and to the point where the parents were starting to worry what others were thinking of her, and, um, and when she refused to speak, um, refused to say hello or thank you, and worried about what the effect of that selective mutism would have on her younger sister. A second boy, a little bit older, 11 years old, um, anxious uh, about uh, social situations. Um, and this child did have some learning difficulties, was left back in the first grade, had current grades about C's or D's. And the father was um, called to school because the teacher didn't know if the child actually spoke English. The child was of Asian descent. Um, and the father was completely unaware that the child was having difficulties or not speaking in class. And the child would simply just nod or bury his head whenever he was asked the questions. He was worried about looking bad in front of other kids and doing something that would, he would um, uh, regret or be made fun of later. Um, the interesting thing about this child was that, like other kids with selective mutism, he had no problem speaking at home, and in fact had this unique um, set of expertise where he actually created a series of YouTube videos um, that provided instructions on how to win a number of uh, uh, Wii and PlayStation video games. And so you could hear him on YouTube speaking very audibly, clearly, um, and knowledgeably about uh, these things that he was interested in, um, as long as he wasn't doing it in person. As you can already see, that the um, interference that comes with this kind of a problem starts to broaden across a number of different domains, including social, academic, and family, where um, the selective uh, uh, talking in situations starts to lead to withdrawal and isolation, um, starts to lead to others to have to accommodate around the child, which um, at first starts to just affect the child, but then eventually leads to affect all those around them and starts to lead to greater family conflict, arguments, as the child's uh, resistance increases. Uh, selective mutism isn't just a single type of problem. In fact, the, um, people have been trying to recently uh, uh, type uh, selective mutism in, in different varieties. What we know from preliminary research, um, particularly out of uh, uh, Murray Stein's lab out at UCSD, um, is that the large majority of these uh, children who display selective mutism is um, uh, that is associated uh, predominantly with anxiety. But there are um, a good chunk of kids who will show some oppositional or behavioral problems. And then there are about 30% who would uh, show a combination of anxiety, behavior, and communication problems. And so the important thing is to really look at this as a multifaceted problem, but that the large, uh, uh, a, a big component of a lot of selective mutism is surrounding anxiety. The actual uh, type of behaviors and impairment come in dimensions. And so it's important to realize it's not just all or nothing, but that we can see behaviors across the spectrum from normally speaking, in which case they wouldn't be selective uh, or selective mute, to very severe, where it goes from uh, uh, speaking normally to only speaking in low audible voices, to speaking through whispers, to just speaking through other people, to speaking only to very select people, to actively resisting, avoiding, or becoming oppositional when they have to go to a situation where they might have to speak to someone that they're uncomfortable. So it's a, uh, a large and diverse continuum of behaviors and, and uh, assorted impairment. Accordingly, it's important that you seek the right kind of help, depending on the level of severity, where um, parents and school professionals um, are going to be required to be acting collaboratively and together um, in all cases of selective mutism. Um, but an outside therapist can be helpful in terms of consultation, even in cases of mild uh, mutism, where the child has limited talk. But in cases of moderate and severe mutism, it's really wise to, to bring in an outside therapist who can have the time and expertise to help 
to generate a plan and, to, and help execute the plan with the parents and the school as well. So what is uh, the different uh, roles that uh, people can play? Well, for the therapist, um, one of the first primary things that a uh, therapist m must do is to conduct a thorough functional assessment. We really want to know the where's, why's, and how much of this behavior is affecting the child. So it's important to really do a fine-tuned assessment of the context you know, of, of where the mute behavior happens. Is it just in school, or is it in varying places of school, and to what degree, small classes, big classes, just with certain teachers, only when there are certain demands on them, like homeworks or tests, um, or in classes where they particularly um, require verbal participation. Um, in home, are they um, universally good at home, or is it just with select members, or is it just when they have to do certain activities? It's important to assess why this selective, um, this mute behavior is happening. Um, does it seem to always be triggered by uh, activities uh, that provoke anxiety in the child? Does it seem to be that the child does it um, and receives a lot of attention after the the um, you know kind of select uh, talking? Um, are they trying to avoid uh, aversive directives like the parents or someone else telling them to do chores or to do something that they're not comfortable with? Um, and certainly, we need to assess whether uh, the mute behavior is actually in response or due to actual lack of skills, whether that be social skills or expressive communication skills or some other learning disability. We need to know the extent in terms of the dimensional um, uh, level of the severity. And we also want to look at how the environment responds to that child and this behavior. How much do others accommodate around? How much do they uh, level uh, criticism to the child? So we want to know in what ways and how and how much um, the environment, including adults and other children, respond um, to the child. One way to do that is uh, using a cognitive behavioral conceptual model. And here we can evaluate each instance of selective selective mute behavior um, in terms of the child's thoughts, their physical feelings, and their actions. Any particular kind of emotion can be broken down to these three components. And I find it a very useful way to understand it better, to make it more concrete. So in response to any one um, set of uh, triggers or one trigger, whether it's a novel social situation, speaking opportunities, situations that require assertiveness, um, we could start to uh, begin to observe by tracking. And that can include the parents, it can include the uh, school counselors or teachers, um, and certainly a therapist when they're brought in, um, but to start to observe when particular triggers um, activate certain responses from the child. So what we would uh, associate most with selectively mute behavior is the degree to which the child freezes um, or clings or hides to um, safe people, um, to the degree to which they talk um, through safety people, uh, to which they're avoiding, escaping, or resisting anything that makes them uncomfortable. Some of the other aspects of a selectively new behavior um, that may be difficult to assess by virtue of the fact that these children um, don't talk very much um, are some of the physical feelings, which they might describe when we do get them to speak, is uh, feeling blank or feeling jittery. And as they get older, they're able to describe these as almost like panic-like feelings, a sudden overwhelming fear that just freezes them. The thoughts are also very difficult. It's not always apparent um, what kind of um, thoughts go through their head when they freeze, um, but a lot of times all they can do is express that they simply can't or they don't have the words. Um, but sometimes, um, particularly with the kids that I mentioned up, up front in those examples, they were able to identify at some point some of the thoughts they had, and they were related often to social anxiety. People will think I'm stupid. Um, I'll sound funny. Others will laugh at me. Okay? But it is true that in a lot of our work, we have to deal uh, pri uh, primarily with the actions and behaviors and orient our treatments around active practice because we can't always get access to the feelings and thoughts, um, both because of the typical age of the children who present with SM, but also because of the actual behaviors of that mutism. Some of the typical um, cognitive behavioral models that we use for anxiety, and this we see this commonly in children from seven years old and up, um, but also it's some with uh, younger kids, um, although with younger kids we would even focus more with parent work. But emotions education is helping children identify feelings that they, that they feel when they're in one of these scary situations. We teach as a first line of defense some relaxation skills so that they can just 
decrease the tension that they feel when anticipating a fearful uh, situation. We try to teach them problem solving, understanding what can they actually do in the situation that would be helpful. Um, and then we start to identify um, you know, those anxious thoughts that I mentioned and how they can start um, doing some, um, applying some coping statements that can address those uh, scary thoughts. Um, but what I'll focus on today a lot, and what we tend to focus on with SM, is the imaginal or in vivo exposure task, which we use as active and real life practice. Because you can talk forever, um, but having talking within a, a therapy room um, simply isn't enough to really get the practice that the child needs to be able to gain the confidence and the skills in order to actually change their behaviors um, and to start to talk in a greater number of situations um, and uh, it, it increasingly um, on their own. Of course, we're going to um, do this while using a lot of reward and praise and homework to generalize uh, uh, these lessons. Of course, as I mentioned, some of these might be de-emphasized when you're dealing with SM behavior where you don't have much insight into their thoughts. Um, one way we start to uh, convey um, and get them used to the idea that we're going to be practicing is first introducing the idea of um, the habituation curve and what happens to anxiety simply over time. So if you ask uh, children or their parents, you know, what would happen in the case that you're feeling anxious in, re in response to some scary situation, whether that's going to school for the first time or even if it's simple as uh, seeing a spider that you're scared of, um, what would happen to anxiety over time? Well, most people would say, well, I would get really scared. So if you were exposed to a spider or if you were about to go into a classroom where you really felt uncomfortable, your anxiety would start to increase. You'd start to get really nervous. But then you want to challenge a child and challenge um, the family to think about what really happens over time. If you just did nothing and just sat in the room with that spider or just sat at your desk um, and, and let the anxiety just sit there. Well, what we know from, from uh, science and from research is that the body was meant to habituate itself, to come to some sort of homeostasis and balance itself out. So even if you did nothing, the body simply can't just sustain um, endless amounts of, of intensity and anxiety. Eventually, it will come back down, and you'll feel more comfortable in the situation. The problem with anxiety is that a lot of these kids who are um, uh, dealing with it, and it's, um, it's um, a, a, relates to kids with SM specifically too, is that what happens is that they start to feel this intense amount of anxiety, and then they'll look for ways to escape. So if they sit in the class, and they just continue to say nothing, and even if they want to participate in an activity, they continue to say nothing, continue to say nothing, then it removes the anxiety, because um, they just have to wait for the teacher to pass by them, and then they don't have to worry about it. The problem is when they escape, they learn, hey, that's actually not bad because if I don't answer a question or even if I go to the nurse's office instead of that class, I feel much better. And they learn that that avoidance is actually an effective technique for reducing anxiety. But what they don't learn is all this other stuff is that if they just stuck it out and they got over this worry hump or this fear hump, that things would get better on their own. And so that's something that we try to communicate both with kids as well as parents and with school professionals as well. Once they understand the concept of what we're trying to do, which is we're trying to get them enough experiences where they actually get to experience that, where they learn that if they just stick it out, that A, they're going to learn that they have more skills than they thought they did, B, the things that they fear were going to happen don't necessarily always happen, and C, things just get better over time. We build what we call a fear hierarchy, or with kids we call it a fear ladder, where we devise a graded set of experiences and exposures and practice experiences um, building on, um, on starting with the easier examples and easier situations where they can practice and build skill upon skill and get better as they go up the ladder. So we could start with just simple kind of um, activities where we help the child try to learn how to talk, but we might start with the therapist taking the lead, um, doing simple verbal modeling, creating discussions, teaching and modeling for the child how one would have a conversation with someone that they never uh, met before. We might then start to increase just their ability to express themselves, even non-verbally, so they get in the habit of expressing themselves and getting their ideas out there. That can be including drawings, cartoons. Um, it can be acting, like charades. Um, at some point, then, we would want them to start moving into the verbal um, behavior realm, where they would not only just write three things down about themselves, but then start to read them out loud. We would start to increase the, um, the diversity of experiences, settings in which they can actually do that behavior. So we might invite a parent in. We might invite another adult in. We might invite other kids in so that they start to um, be able to uh, get practice in and feel comfortable doing the same behavior but in, in broader settings. 
um, we continue to increase the challenge of those um, uh, ex uh, exposures so that they continue to grow, increasing the um, lack of structure of, of, the, of the situation. So we might, instead of letting them write down their talk um, or their words, that we'd ask them to actually you know, give an impromptu or unplanned speech. And then we continue to move towards more naturalistic settings where we would have them, um, you know, have regular social interactions with people either at, at our office, um, um, but then move outside of the office and go around our campus or go to playgrounds where they get to talk and meet um, with kids and practice social situations. So you continue to build from easier situations to hard situations where you're getting closer to the actual situation that you want them to be um, talking in. So that's the therapist's role. It's really to help identify key fears for the child and to help build practice opportunities around those fears so that the child gains some confidence. What's the parent's role? How can they help? Well, they're going to be an active uh, participant in all the work that the therapist and the child are doing as well, providing information um, and also uh, helping to find practice opportunities at home. But there's some other specific things that we want to um, uh, convey to the parent. And a lot of that has to do with conveying or changing the parent's mindset about how they think about their child's anxiety and how they think about the child's um, SM behavior and response to that anxiety. So a good part of that is also conducting an assessment about how the parent and child are interacting and how sometimes that um, interaction pattern can maintain the mutism or at least uh, misses opportunities to encourage speech where it could be encouraged. Um, we'll be uh, uh, conveying to them the importance of reinforcing and rewarding all good speech and all approach behaviors, talking or active engagement, whether it's verbal or nonverbal, to really actively uh, reinforce that with immediate, quick, and meaningful rewards, while also actively ignoring the unwanted behaviors like the clinging, the, the hiding, um, complaining, reassurance seeking, and really to help parents feel OK and give them permission to step away from that um, so that they can avoid the cycle of negotiation and appeasement that often happen when a child is anxious and then which provokes their SM behavior. Um, in order to help with that, we help devise a reward chart and assign rewards to encourage and reward child, um, a child's proactive behavior. Um, and of course, we involve the parents in devi uh, devising that gradual hierarchy that we described with a the therapist and how the parents can extend that into, the, into home environments as well. And the overall goals really are to help reduce the child's dependence on the adults so that when they are faced with anxiety, they find that they can build their own confidence to deal with those situations themselves and not rely on a safety person and talk behind them. Um, and, and, and then these, uh, our other goal is to also actually increase the speaking and social skills that the children have. So what kind of parent-child and parents do we tend to see and do we need to increase awareness of? Well, let's take this example of, a, of a, a mother and a child going to an ice cream parlor. Um, it's kind of typical of, of the type of example that we um, see in the clinic. So a parent and a son walk into an ice cream parlor. Um, the parent gives a little nudge to the child to ask for their favorite ice cream. The child hides behind um, the parent and refuses to ask. And because the parent's a little embarrassed, doesn't know, um, you know whether the child will ever um, you know, ask, um, the parent goes ahead and orders mint chocolate chip ice cream for the, the child. The child gets the um, um, ice cream, and you go to the table. Um, in, in the moment, that seems like a reasonable thing to do. But what it's doing is that it is accommodating around the child's anxiety in that situation. Um, likewise, uh, the child might, then you, you move to the table. The, he, the child starts to drip his mint chocolate chip ice cream onto his shirt. Um, and it really could use a napkin. Um, but instead of the parent um, prompting the child to go up to the counter and asking for a napkin, the parent goes up and asks for one themselves to bring it back. And the child eats quietly and, and wipes himself off um, from the ice cream. Now, you know, that seems like responsive parenting. At the same time, what has happened is that you've missed the opportunity to provide some sort of learning experience for the child where they can experiment in a fairly um, uh, risk-free environment um, the ability to go up and try out asking for something that they need. And why does this happen? Well, the accommodation usually happens in this kind of cyclical way because it's usually often the easiest thing to do in the moment. But not only that, but because it feels like the most compassionate, responsive thing. The most important thing that we try to convey to parents is that we're not thinking that the parents are being irresponsible or not smart enough to figure this out. They're very aware of this. They know that they're often doing this. 
um, but it often seems like they're just trying to be responsive to the child. We are the first to admit that ch children come to the table with their own anxiety. We can identify this in the early months of life. Um, they come more irritable, temperamental, um, and they're more anxious. And so children bring it themselves. And the parents are being responsive to that. They see their child being anxious. No one wants to see their kid being upset. And so they try to do what would be the most responsive thing to do. But unfortunately, what that does is that over time, it doesn't allow the child the opportunities to gain confidence or to learn how they can tolerate that distress even when they are anxious. And even if the situations are legitimate, they, do, they miss an opportunity to really um, show that they can do it. And so that's what we want to do is get into the mindset where we're going to give parents permission to allow their child to feel a little distress because in the long run, it's much more helpful. How do we do that? Well, we help by devising some um, tracking instruments where we'd have uh, you know, parents, and the kid can participate as well, in um, identifying tricky situations that they usually have, identifying how the child usually reacts, identifying how the parent reacts to that child's reaction, and then identifying how the child react in response to the adult's response, right? So in our example of the ice cream parlor, um, you know, what we see is that the child is hiding behind the parent, and the parent might say that they feel bad or there's a line behind us, I order for him or her, um, and the child seems relieved. The child gets their ice cream, the child is talkative and happy for me. So that's really reinforcing for the, the parent. They learn, okay, that's the easiest way to go, and, or that's the way that I keep my, my child happy, but it's really accommodating around the child's anxiety. Likewise, in a similar situation with, like, say, um, uh, a child, a parent uh, visiting a birthday party of, of with kids, and, and the parent sees the child um, playing on on the side um, with a group of kids, but really on the side and non-verbally with other kids, and the parent starts to wonder, you know, I wonder if the other kids think something's wrong. Um, you know, I don't want uh, my child to feel like an outcast, so they, they tell their child to come back over to them, and so the child sticks by them the entire party. Well, you know, then you know, the child comes by, they stay by you the whole time, and what's happening is that um, unintentionally um, the parent there is reinforcing um, avoidance there. So how do we go about trying to change that mindset about that? Well, you know, like I'm saying, that we want to first uh, try to emphasize to, to the parents that, um, you know, what the pattern does, and then we also want to give them permission to start to think differently, and what we want to do is basically do something very simple and cliche that we use, and it's a, 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 a kind of a mantra uh, that's used to help parents um, push through some of the stress that they'll feel when they see their, anxious, uh, their child being anxious, and that's called empathize and encourage. And what that's um, meant to, to do is just give the parents something quick and easy and something to respond to a child when they're feeling anxious. So instead of getting into this kind of cycle of negotiating, well, do you think you can do this, or why don't you try that, and if you do this, I'll give you that, Skip that in the moment and instead do something very simple. You don't want to abandon your child. You don't want to seem like you don't care about the child's anxiety. And so we encourage parents to first empathize. Do that active listening. Actually say, you know, I know this makes you nervous or I know this is difficult. I know going up to that counter is really scary. Okay, But don't get too lost in that and instead move quickly to the encourage part, which is just simply demonstrating calm, accepting attitude and giving them um, uh, some uh, prompt to act in a proactive way that kind of keeps them going. Um, you can engage them in problem solving, but the important thing is to resist the temptation to actually pacify or give them reassurance or to do the problem solving for the child. So that's also a lot of what parents will do. They'll say, oh, why don't you try this? Or why don't you try that? And instead, what we want to do is say something very cliche of saying, you know, I know you're, you're feeling nervous. I know this is tough for you. I know we've been through this before. But at the same time, I know you can do it and just direct them to doing what you want them to do. So this both conveys that you're actually listening, you're there, but at the same time, you're going to expect them to keep doing it. And when the child starts to respond like, I can't do this or you don't care, you respond in exactly the same way. I know this is difficult, um, but like we said, we're going to be encouraging um, um, you to try to do things on your own, so I know you can really do it. And release yourself from the responsibility of having to kind of really negotiate on the spot with the child. And so this combined with the more kind of planful um, uh, exposure exercises that we're going to be implementing and combined with the reward program that we're going to be instituting, this gives you something in the moment to really um, uh, you know, stop the debate and the arguments. So that's the kind of mindset that we're going to uh, try to help parents with. Um, but what do school uh, professionals, uh, uh, pl what role do they play in this setting? And they really play a huge role in connecting the child's home and outside life together. Um, since parents don't get to see um, how children react in schools, 
and uh, the school professionals uh, don't know how the parent, uh, how the child acts at home, it's important that there's active communication uh, between these groups because um, uh, these are two major domains of the child's life. Um, so how do we uh, do this? Uh, what's our general approaches? Well, first, we want to foster this collaboration from the get-go. As soon as that there's any identification of any SM behavior, whether it's from the parents or whether it's from the school, Let's start by identifying a liaison, someone at the school, and that can be a school counselor, it can be a school nurse, it can be a school psychologist, and it can be an attendance officer, it can be um, even an academic teacher, um, if they've been noticing if this, if they have um, the time to be able to participate in this, that would be great. We've worked with a lot of um, professionals across those different um, uh, disciplines. Um, establish a, a family and school joint meeting, um, both with and without the child, and so that you can both talk um, about adult things and then bring them in and get the child's um, kind of buy-in as well. Um, and this is a great opportunity for uh, the school professionals uh, out there. Uh, share information about what you're seeing in school. This might be the first time that the child, of the parents really hearing this. And so you uh, describe what your concerns are. Uh, you move towards agreeing to goals um, and knowing how far the school can accommodate there in terms of what resources they have. Do they have, um, you know, uh, ways to, uh, to allow this graded uh, progression in talking. So could they start with having them have some private tutors? Could they start them with in small groups? What does the school have in their natural setup um, that would allow um, some of the practice that we're going to be instituting? Um, and importantly, more than just the goals, you need to agree on what the, the roles of everyone will be. Uh, so you talk about that. You devise some goals, um, which for us would always be to increase talking behaviors, um, but also increase verbal and nonverbal socialization. So any kind of socialization is good socialization. And breaking the goals into small steps um, where you know you all engage some sort of problem solving, you identify the barriers ahead of time so that you see that it's not going to be easy work on either part from the home or the school, and that you problem solve those together. And the idea is that you also want to establish, like, set those goals with some idea of rewards um, that could be rewarded, um, awarded both at home and school. So if there's some activities that the child really likes at school, like feeding the frog or you know, um, uh, cleaning out the chalk, uh, I guess you don't, probably don't have chalk uh, um, uh, erasers anymore, but something that, that's uh, fun and, and prize in the classroom can be used as, as, uh, an, as a reward for you know, progressive uh, talking behavior and something that also the uh, teacher or the school counselor can give feedback and track and give feedback to the parents so that they can reward at home as well. Uh, just in terms of thinking about different roles, uh, these also tend to vary a little bit depending on severity, um, where, you know, for uh, most mild cases or even moderate cases, what the school counselor or psychologist or caseworker is, is doing is providing school perspective. Um, giving information, monitoring school behavior, um, seeking practice opportunities where they can, and also ensuring academic needs for the child as well. So in the case that where, and this is where school professionals have a lot of room to uh, help, I, they, because they can, um, uh, or a lot of expertise, because they see the large kind of swath of children, they can identify kids who might benefit from a learning assessment, and it might be helpful just to rule out whether any learning disabilities exist. Um, but importantly, particularly when the SM behavior becomes more severe, uh, the school professional um, is, is going to have to assume uh, a number of other roles, including being the local champion. Um, because if you're a school nurse or a school uh, counselor or psychologist, you're likely going to have more information and knowledge about selective mutism, about uh, psychological functioning in general, than the average academic teacher. Um, now, they, there might be some that are very knowledgeable, but uh, their job really is to uh, teach academic um, classwork. And so your job will have to be to be knowledgeable, to be able to educate teachers, um, because some teachers might be um, uh, uh, misinterpreting uh, mute behavior as being oppositional. They may, uh, in contrast, may actually permit avoidance as a way for them to be uh, compassionate. So they might see a child being very shy and say, well, I don't want to push them. And what we want to be doing is educating teachers about the approach that we're going to be um, uh, adopting universally, which is that empathize and encourage teaching um, teachers that we want them to both avoid criticism as well as over accommodation. Get them to buy into this idea that we're going to be calm and confident um, with the kids. 
Um, the school family liaison um, can then serve as kind of a, a, a mediary where they're um, informing the family about school behavior using trackers and some feedback forms. Um, and they can also keep teachers updated about family efforts because a lot of teachers sometimes get discouraged if they think that the families aren't putting in the effort or aren't aware of the problem. So they're trying to do some adaptation in the classroom but don't know what the family is doing. And so if the school counselor or uh, liaison can really keep the teachers up to date about what the family is doing, they'll feel like they're not alone. And uh, often we find that teachers will be more willing to keep putting in effort um, because they know that the family is also invested. Uh, and then if there's time and resources, um, school counselors and other professionals can help plan the graded um, practices and exposures that can occur in class. And so work with the teachers to uh, think creatively about where there are natural practice opportunities that don't require a lot of adaptation in the classroom, um, whether that's um, finding opportunities for a child to participate in a small lunch group or um, finding ways if they're com more comfortable in art class, how they can actually help share their work and not just do their work privately. Um, things like that where they it fits into the natural uh, workings of the day, but also gives opportunities for the child. Um, and then, you know, uh, so to make sure that we rule out all possibilities, um, be thinking about whether you think the child might um, uh, need a learning assessment or not, making sure that if there is a formal learning disability that uh, we take care of those needs. Uh, so that's about all I have time for it, um, but I want to just make sure that you um, a share, if you have more interest in this, uh, some resources that are helpful both for uh, school professionals. Uh, Chris Curry wrote a very nice practical um, guide to help school professionals um, both assess and uh, uh, pr uh, conduct at least initial uh, interventions in the school, as well as for therapists out there, um, uh, the Coping Cat Workbook really is the kind of gold standard in helping treat um, kids with anxiety problems um, in clinical settings. Um, and for parents out there, um, there's a, a really nice consumer network um, at selectivemutism.org that has some basic facts and some other connections and resources um, that can help you. So I really appreciate your attention and for having me, and I hope that uh, this is helpful. Um, and with that, I'd like to open it up to questions. Wow, thank you, Dr. Chu. That was a really a lot of information. And I have to tell you, the questions have been coming in fast and furious. Okay, so I'm going to jump right into this, and we'll get to as many as we can, OK? OK. Um, had an inquiry about a first grade student who will not respond to vision or hearing screening. Neither will she engage in activities. But she does speak with selected classmates and very quietly to the teacher. So could you just expand on that a little bit? Yeah, that's a great example of a child who's struggling with selective mutism because, you know, we think of um, often anxious behavior and, and SM behavior to occur in maybe classically social situations like being called on in a class or maybe in gym class being called on to do something. But it doesn't always have to be in some of those high profile uh, situations. It can happen in something unexpected like going to a nurse's office, which is a one-on-one -on -one thing. They go down for their routine annual checkup and then suddenly they shut down or they show oppositional behavior and uh, often the nurse or someone else doesn't know how to interpret that. Um, and so this is a great situation um, that, that uh, shows us how to identify these problems. And the most important thing, um, or uh, the worst thing that you can do, is to try to deal with this problem um, in the moment that you first notice it, I mean, uh, and, and let it, that be your only intervention. So what you want to do is when, once you've noticed that, we want to start planning for the next time. Okay, because it's not really important how you manage it in that first situation. Once the nurse notices that, that's a good time to, to uh, reach out to the family and start to uh, discuss, you know, what can we do um, to prepare the child for the next year? Um, so because uh, these health checkups are required on a yearly basis and we need to have them, and it's a good idea that they have them, so what can we do to prepare them for the next year? So that's when um, you can work with the family and then perhaps the family can bring in an outside consultant slash therapist and start to um, uh, identify where the specific triggers for this child are and do all the assessment and then the uh, skill building and then the, the graded uh, uh, training and exposures with the child. Now, what's perfect about this situation is that now you have a specific example. Sometimes these children come into treatment with us and uh, they deny that they have any problems. And they say, no, I'm fine. I don't, I don't mind this or I'm, I'm OK. But here it gives us a specific uh, uh, incident where they did have problems and we say, okay, we're going to orient around nurses because, you know, it's important that you do get health checkups and so 
you know, we're going to ha get you practice and build some situations where you can practice being around someone new. We're going to give you practice around being around health um, things, like maybe uh, where you might be afraid of needles and things like that. We can do that in session. We can do that um, at the clinic where we expose you to first to needles, um, then to like uh, or to Q-tips, uh, then to a stethoscope, and then to needles, so that at least they get used to that, and then we can start um, bringing them in to the nurse and start having them um, uh, get acclimated to that as well as acclimated to the procedures that the nurse wants to use um, so that it's a graded experience so that the next time it comes, uh, the child will be prepared. And the great thing about this is that uh, some people react to these uh, uh, plans and they say, oh, gosh, that takes a lot of work or that's going to take a long time. The great thing about this is that you, you pick one theme they go into the nurse's office, and you build a nice set of hierarchies around it, um, the, the skills generalize. So the child's not just learning how to get their ears checked at the nurse. What they're learning is, how do I know when I'm getting anxious? When I'm getting anxious, what kind of thoughts do I have? When I'm getting anxious, how do I freeze? And then what can I do when I freeze? And even if I do still feel that anxiety, can I get through it? And so just because they're learning about the nurse, it then starts to generalize to the next time that they have to ask like you know, a teacher for help, or it generalizes to the next time they're at lunch and the lines change and they don't know what to do. So that's a perfect example of a time when you want to start something um, and then plan ahead and be prepared to do some work around it, but it will really pay off in the end. And by the way, when I say work, um, you know, we even uh, in bringing kids in here with relatively uh, moderate to severe uh, SM behavior um, can see pretty major change within you know, four or five months within um, 12 to 16 uh, meetings. And so uh, it can happen pretty quickly. All right. Just going back to that for one second, though, it, when it's, for example, the vision hearing screening thing, that seems to me that that's, um, that's a little bit different from, you know, not engaging act in other activities. This is like driven some motivation otherwise than just not wanting to have the vision or the hearing screened. Well, that's what's good about an assessment. And so once you have identified this situation, you'd want to uh, sit the child down, do some talking, um, as well as, as start that tracking in, uh, in all their daily life to see how consistent this problem is. And so what you want to see is, like, is it only happen in, in situations where there might be some sort of health checkup, where they might be prodded or probed, or whether it happens any time they're asked to do something that's um, uh, where they're asked to comply with something. And so okay. that's exactly where someone might interpret that as oppositional behavior. And in the yeah. end, it is oppositional behavior. They're opposing something you want them to do. But we have to look at, OK, what do we think is prompting that oppositional it's behavior? Driving it. Are they feeling anxious? And uh, there are some kids, like I said, there were about 15% of these kids who uh, it's not about anxiety. It's about because they want to get what they want. And we can figure that out and we help assess like, you know, whether or not you know, it's because the child just doesn't like to do with anything that someone tells you and I don't really care and why are you bothering me and this is really irritating me and I think I know better than you. That's okay. a different kind of a kid than the kid that I'm talking about, which is that they, they might oppose and get really angry and look oppositional, but it's a lot because they get frozen, they don't know how to deal with it, they're really anxious inside. All right, thank you. Um, Another one, um, how would you help a child generalize talking with other adults and peers in a school setting? Yeah, exactly like the hierarchy that I uh, described earlier on that we do in the clinic setting, we can um, uh, you know, translate that over to schools. And so uh, often we'll go into schools and consult but then, and bring um, you know, the school liaison um, in on it and so that they can start generating, uh, generalizing as well. And uh, what we do is, is simple. We start in where situations where there's any room for growth. So if they feel, uh, you know, for most of these kids will have one classroom teacher at that time. Uh, but if, you know, we might, they might feel really comfortable with a particular librarian. So uh, one class a day or, you know, one period a day we might go down there or during lunchtime or something like that. We would go and we have, help them start to practice with that comfortable person. Now, some people might be scared and say, well, we don't want to teach them how to avoid things and only just talk to their safety person. But when we are doing it as part of a hierarchical planned um, ladder, it, it, it's serving to show growth. So we start with that person they feel safe with, build up their level of talking. Um, often the, uh, the quality of these kids' um, speech is not great, and so they'll only answer in one-word responses. So we start building them up where we expect 
and reward accordingly um, more complex speech, more personal speech, more creative speech. Um, and so they do that with the safe person. And then we bring in someone that's a little bit more scary, whether that's another teacher or whether that's a kid. And then so we can do that in the safe environment. We bring them to the, the library. So wherever that is, whether it's the library, whether it's the attendance office or whatever, we bring them to their safe environment. Then once they're comfortable with that, we go back to their classroom and say, okay, your assignment today is to, you know, um, you know, just talk to your neighbor, you know, for, uh, ask them three questions. Um, and so then you get them, like, you know, just to kind of reach out. And this is where it's helpful to, to bring the teacher into it and to say, just today we're going to do an experiment. See if, uh, you know, little uh, Billy um, can ask three questions of, of uh, Johnny next to him. And so you continue to build in a hierarchical way, just like we do in the clinic, but it just happens to be with, with the, in the school. OK, now, good. Yep. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, this is, uh, by the way, the Kearney book that uh, I have up there gives great examples and guidance in terms of how to create these hierarchies for schools. My personal experience, I would love for school professionals to be able to do this. My experience is that they just don't have the time to do all that. And mm -hmm. that's why it's important to bring in outside therapists who can um, do some of this uh, in-depth assessment and have the time to simply generate and then collaborate with the school professionals uh, as a way to make sure that it, it makes sense um, and then can um, like maybe go into the schools or consult with them so that they can be doing some of this, um, this work because, you know, school counselors, for example, have hundreds of kids that they have to be, uh, you know, monitoring. They want to be involved, but we have to figure out how to divide up the labor. How to do it, yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you explain all of this to other adults, you know, the extended family, the grandparents, and so forth, and how, how to interact with an individual or a kid when they're experiencing this, so they don't reply when they're spoken to. Yeah, it's really, I think it all comes down to that same empathize and encourage, because I think what happens when they see a kid who's really anxious and frozen, they start to fear for the child, and that's what activates their own anxiety, and so then they start to get critical, like, you know, grandpa, grandma looks up over to the parent and says, you know, well, what's going on with, uh, you know, little Billy? Why, don't, why doesn't he talk, and what aren't you doing? And that starts to cycle of blame and anxiety that we want to avoid. And I think that we would help the, the parent to explain the same kind of thing that, um, you know, that we explain to the parent. And that's what we hope that they buy into, that, you know, Billy's just kind of um, anxious. You know, he gets really kind of nervous in these situations. Um, he's always been a little nervous. And, uh, but we're, you know, he's learning how to kind of um, manage that anxiety on his own. Um, so what I try to do is just kind of accept it. He's going to struggle. He's going to um, fall on his face a couple of times. So, you know, mom and dad, if you wouldn't mind that, like, you know, uh, when you see it yourself, don't do it for him. Just, like, kind of listen to him, appreciate that he's anxious, but then encourage him to do it. And know that uh, with time, he's going to end up learning how to kind of keep doing it on his own. Um, but uh, yeah, and and then we're going to give you permission. That's our job, the therapist. It's our job to give the parents permission not to take it personal, not to be worried. If there are people out there who are going to judge you, then you know they're probably not worth worrying about too much anyway. But I'll tell you, if you worry too much about them, it's going to make you change how you react to your child, and then it's not going to be beneficial to your child, and so it's going to be self-defeating anyway. Okay. Um, how do you help a child who's about four and a half? Deal with critical thoughts when he often can't express these thoughts. What you yeah. basically get from him is, you know, I can't do it, or I won't, or or nothing. Great. I mean, and that's a great example, and that's what we typically deal with, and um, that's why practice is so important. Um, that's why uh, you know therapies that that stay focused on talking, or stay in a clinic room, or focus on just your thoughts, um, can be nonproductive because at this age, and also with this particular problem. Kids may not have the greatest insight to what is causing them to be freeze, um, nor will talking about it really help. And so that's where we do work actively with the parents, um, um, because if you can change the response that people have around them, being empathizing and encouraging, that helps. And we're going to actually just do things with them. We physically go out there and do these things with them so that they see like a coach is going out there to you know, the field with them and, and get practice. They're actually practicing and experiencing success and we don't have to talk about it. Now, we do talk about it, but we're not relying on the child getting insight and saying, oh, I'm, I'm freezing because I really get scared um, because someone's going to judge me, um, and so that makes me freeze. You might never get that kind of insight, and we're not going to rely on it. What they're going to experience is that, OK, I'm going to go to this counter where there's an ice cream guy, and I'm going to ask for mint chocolate chip. 
And if my counselor goes with me and we go and I ask for mint chocolate chip and I get mint chocolate chip, I've just learned that I have the power to ask for mint chocolate chip and receive ice cream in return. Mm -hmm. And you keep doing that, and over time, the child, the thoughts don't really mean as much because the thoughts will change on their own and they'll start to say to themselves, oh, I guess there's some things that I can do if I just practice them enough. The mint chocolate chip wins out, right? The mint chocolate chip and the kid win out. Yeah. All right. Um, I have a question about um, a child who is in a, um, a pre-K program. Um, and this child is uh, Latino, and he's been presenting with SM-like characteristics since he began in the program in 2007. Initially, they thought it was a English as a second language issue, but he's, he's fluent in English. And the question is about getting him evaluated, and, and would a, a developmental pediatrician be the place to start? Great. I mean, how old was the child again? I missed that. Or, uh, hmm. Or I want to say pre-K, so probably four oh, to four and a half. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, um, and I'll admit that, that pre-K is a little bit out of my range. Uh, the, the kids that we tend to work with at the clinic are, um, you know, starting about seven years old and, and up. So this is a little bit younger than my expertise. Um, and so I, I, I would um, first consult uh, the pediatrician um, as well as uh, a learning specialist. Um, to um, who uh, you know whether it's, whether it's a you know school psychologist or it's some sort of speech pathologist who can assess you know whether there might be some sort of communication um, delay around and pre-K is still fairly early and so some of those things are hard to detect. Yeah, in, um, in this particular case, the child apparently speaks through friends and he whis whispers right. to them, oh, but when they're not around, he completely shuts down. Right, great. Yeah, so that's a very typical case of, of SM, and I think it's still worthwhile, I mean, to rest your mind at ease, um, go get a consult with a school psychologist or someone like that who can um, administer some nonverbal um, assessments of learning styles, and so that you know that, okay, it doesn't, he seems to be learning and expressing himself in normal ways. Certainly the fact that there are selective situations where he's very verbal or comfortable shows that it's probably not an expressive problem, Right, because if he can talk to you and he doesn't have any problems, then it's it's likely to be about like we talked about one of those those um, uh, factors like anxiety, possibly opposition, but I haven't heard any evidence for that. And so that for that, um, bring him to a counselor or to a, a parent, um, uh, you know, someone who can do some parent training. Um, because you know, for kids that young, it's you can do anything with a parent training or work with a therapist who can help the family um, learn how to encourage the child to uh, uh, be more open to social exchanges. And so very similar process to what I've just been describing. Um, but it is true that, um, you know, as with, with younger kids, it's helpful to um, rule out some things. But, I, you know, I think a psychologist, particularly a cognitive behavioral therapist, would be most appropriate to doing assessments about okay. functional you. role uh, of sexual mutism. In your experience, would you say, would you, or would you think that there might be an increased incidence of SM in children adopted from a foreign country, even though they're fluent in English at home? Uh, that's an interesting question, and I'll be honest that I don't have any data on that, so I'd be hesitant to kind of offer up a guess. I would imagine that there's a number of um, kind of acculturation and socialization issues that I think that we'd want to be mindful of and monitor throughout the child's life. It's not just about speaking. It's not just about, um, you know, early, uh, you know, entry into school. But throughout their life, they're going to be realizing that they're different. Um, they're going to realize that they uh, culturally feel different than, um, than um, the people around them. And so I think uh, being shy, uh, feeling different uh, might be a broader uh, issue than just um, some of the, you know, simple anxiety that we've been talking about. So I think that you could address it in much the same way um, and uh, make sure you do a good assessment about what situations trigger. So whether it's in speaking situations or whether it's in particular situations where they might feel different might be useful to assess. Um, but in terms of incidence, I, I really couldn't speak about whether there, there are greater rates or not. I think that you'd want to be mindful uh, for an adopted or an immigrant child um, you know, who's come over early uh, in their life to a new country. Um, you know, for all those kids, I think you'd want to monitor those issues. Okay. Um, 
in a social skills group therapy session, is it best to have a mixture of temperaments, such as loud, talkative peers, as well as quiet peers, with in the same program as a, a DSM child? Yeah, there has been some evidence that suggests that it's good to have some social models so that if you have shy kids or anxious kids, that sometimes it's good to have some kids who are confident and uh, very socially skilled and so that, that uh, the anxious kids can learn from the, uh, from the socially uh, more confident kids, um, both in just how they're naturally talking um, amongst people as well as actually participating in those conversations. And so that can be helpful. Um, and so that, that can be good. It's not necessary. So if you can't find kind of like peer mentor uh, volunteers, it's not necessary. And there's lots of data to suggest that um, uh, groups that don't include those social models, those can be successful too. So it's not required, but it can be helpful. OK. Um, this is a, a comment about a 10-year-old girl. And she has had SM since she was four. Um, Basically, the mom is homeschooled, and the, the, the question was kind of lengthy. And, and apparently, she's doing pretty well right now. The, the, the part of it, though, is she still struggles with anxiety, bites her nails, and so forth. And the mom is wondering if whether the anxiety will bother her in different forms as she grows up. And, and is it really treating the underlying anxiety that they should be looking at? Right. Well, I, I didn't hear what kind of treatment uh, they sought to help out or if they sought any at all. If if they um, received a treatment like the one that I described, it, it will help Not um, clear here in the underlying question. anxiety. And it will generalize, just like I was describing, that you know, just because you're, you're training a child to um, go to the nurse's office uh, doesn't mean that they'll only be good at going to the nurse's office, that those skills will generalize around. And similarly, if, a, if with this child, if there was a focus on helping the child manage their own anxiety, not just accommodate around it, but manage their own anxiety and going out and getting socialized, I think that will generalize. But I'm very clear to say that we don't view anxiety as something that we're going to eradicate through treatment. Um, that is something that um, one has a natural tendency towards when you're born. And you may always be um, kind of naturally inclined to be anxious in certain situations. What we help you do is learn how to manage that. And what we have uh, data for is that um, kids um, at the end of a program tend to do significantly better um, with their anxiety, um, but they also continue to grow in those um, as we follow them out. Um, so uh, kids after one year, three year, five years, seven years, they tend to get better. And what we believe is that they're, we're teaching them a coping template that they learn and that they can filter new information through over time. And so they actually continue to get better. You don't see all the gains just at the end of the program. It's a strategy that they can use going forward. Then. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. OK. Um, what, is, what role do you see, if any, of a speech language pathologist in the school-based treatment? Yeah, very important. I think that um, you can you can probably um, do some assessment before whether you need to involve a, a speech pathologist. But once you do, it's, it might be useful to um, to get a speech pathologist or occupational therapist to help um, uh, the child uh, feel comfortable speaking or accessing different ways to uh, learning different ways to access information so that they can express themselves. Um, I think that it's helpful. You know, part of the thing you're looking for is. Can this child speak absolutely fluently and comfortably in other situations? So um, the, the girl that I presented at the beginning, she was very fluent at home, but just very mute at school. And so we didn't suspect that there would be some sort of learning disability or actual kind of difficulty accessing information and then expressing it. With the boy I described, you know, while he was very comfortable talking in certain situations, there were some fluency problems. You could hear that even in situations where he was comfortable, he had some difficulties connecting sentences together. Um, he had some difficulties really kind of always being very linear in his, in his speech. And so when you notice problems like that, that's a good time to bring in like a speech pathologist and to help identify the specific problem, which is not in my expertise. But then also, those uh, professionals will often, um, the way that they treat is to give lots of practice. And so that's always helpful, whether it's just practicing pronouncing, whether it's practice you know, um, talking about things that are important to them and, and, and using creative uh, creativity in terms of expressing yourself. And so that will be helpful because it's along the same lines of, of treatment that we provide as well. OK. Um, what do you think about a family situation where the family refuses to believe that 
the, the child has a problem and that there's punishment involved for not speaking. Yeah, we don't really uh, endorse punishment. Like I mentioned, that we, we uh, absolutely do uh, assessment and tracking and then um, come up with rewards in order to encourage good behavior. And the first thing we say is, is that, listen, you know, um, you know, these might be behaviors that you just expect of other kids, but your kid just not like that, and so they need some help. And so, what we want to do is encourage that behavior. Now, we talk about contingency management, and we talk about consequences. So, if there is oppositional behavior, they can lose points as well. But there's, there's a difference between um, we phrase it as not earning privileges. And so, for example, if a kid really loves to come home and watch a certain TV show, um, if they're refusing to um, to uh, uh, do some sort of activity that we've all agreed on, like you know that they will go to school and they'll sit in class, um, whereas you know previously um, you know the child might refuse to go to class. Um, if they refuse to do that, then they lose they lose the privilege of seeing that TV show at night, um, and so you know they don't get uh, punished by it, but they lose that opportunity. But the the reason why it's not really a punishment, they get to re a new chance to re earn that the next day. So you have another chance to go to class, and you have a chance to earn that privilege back. Uh, tomorrow, and it's a daily renewable privilege that they can be earning. Um, the important thing, what distinguishes it from punishment, is that we are careful not to um, include any kind of blame or embarrassment um, for the child, because there's a difference between saying, "Listen, you know, we want to help you grow, we want you to improve, and you know, we need to encourage you. So if you don't do these things that are expected of a child, then you won't be able to get these other privileges that a child can earn." There's a difference between saying that and saying, you know, I don't understand why you're not doing this. You know, you never seem to, like, you know, keep up with your other classmates. And this is just like, you know, it's going to end up, like, biting in the bud. No one's going to want to hang out with you because that kind of criticism, and that can happen in any sort of ways by even not saying that, but by punishing them by saying, you know, if you don't go into that nurse's office, I'm going to, you know, um, you know uh, take away all these things from you, okay, something that you didn't uh, kind of agree upon beforehand. I'm going to take away all these things for you, and I'm, you know, it's, it's going to really uh, bite you in the butt in the, in the long run. Then it creates shame, it creates embarrassment, and they ha it, it reduces the motivation for them to uh, try to try more. Okay. Um, how successful has therapy been with an older student who has never had therapy and was initially diagnosed in fourth grade with SM and is now in eighth grade? Is it, you know? I don't want to say it's too late, but how? right, it's never too late. No, okay. I mean, I mean Good. We, I won't see, say we, that see, we see adults. We see adults uh, as well, uh, and by by the time they become adults, often kids with a history of untreated SM, um, you know, have, have become functional in social settings. But they're still you can identify them as still shy, as inhibited, as um, have a paucity of speech. You know, so it's not very fluid, um, and so you know at that great they you can treat them like adults or for this adolescent would treat them like an adolescent and um, you know I think the treatment would, would center more around maybe the social anxiety that's maintaining some of that um, uh, limited speech um, and so it just you know at that, at that rate it becomes uh, very similar to a lot of our other um, anxiety treatments and um, the, the mute behavior or the selected behavior um, becomes yet something else that we want to practice encouraging around Okay. There was also a question, um, you know, relating to someone who suffers as a child, and what does it look like as, you know, as an adult? So you kind of well, it often uh, done it, that. Yeah, it often turns into uh, what we tend to think of as social anxiety disorder, or it can be something where, um, uh, you know, it, social anxiety can can look like where someone's just really anxious or freezes or holds themselves back or withdraws from social situations. Um, and uh, but you can also uh, just see these kids continuing to grow up and then continuing to be isolated. So even less than uh, so. So um, for those that are familiar with social anxiety disorder in adults, not every person who has social anxiety had selective mutism as a kid. Um, but uh, people who had selective mutism might end up kind of isolating themselves out. So uh, adults with social anxiety might have friends. They just get nervous in novel social situations. Mm -hmm. Someone with selective mutism might just have a, a, a lack of friends, really be isolated, and be alone because it's hard for them to reach out. Okay. Um, we have time for maybe two more questions. So I'm hoping that our audience stays with us. But if you don't and you have to leave, just be sure to uh, fill out the, um, the um, 
evaluation when you sign off. Um, so let me find a question here that hopefully um, we'll be able to get to. There was a question about anxiety medications. I don't even know if that's something you want to I want to touch on. But yeah, I, uh, I can talk about, uh, generally about it. Obviously, I don't prescribe medications. Um, and uh -huh. It's not my expertise, but you know, I, um, I, I think uh, when uh, people prescribe medications for kids with selective mutism, it's most often to address the anxiety that's underlying it. So that's usually something like an SSRI, um, like a, a Prozac or a Zoloft. And um, you know, uh, right now we just haven't had a lot of good tests. Um, with using um, uh, those kind of medications with kids this young, where selective mutism um, is, uh, is, uh, presents itself. Um, we do have some, some good tests of uh, SSRIs and drugs like that um, being used in older kids, um, you know, starting in 9, 10 years old, and when used in combination with cognitive behavioral therapy um, has been pretty effective, um, although cognitive behavioral therapy um, is effective um, without medications as well. Um, but we, we really don't... Um, know, uh, you know, uh, specifically how well those medications work with kids this young. And so uh, I think that uh, if parents are concerned or nervous about, um, uh, you know, uh, starting with a medication, they can certainly try a short course of, of uh, treatment like this um, using cognitive behavioral therapy and see how that's helping. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly, you know, most of the kids that we treat here aren't on medication, um, and, or, and we certainly don't prescribe it, uh, so we do see uh, positive benefits um, for those kids even when they're not on medication. Without, okay. I have an interesting question about twins. <sighs> and um, the, uh, this is posed as having someone seen several cases of twins with selective mutism. Often one child will talk just a little. And in a particular situation with twins, um, is it, is it, uh, does one child often ultimately encourage the other or what, what's any well, it can go either way. I mean, and with twins, you never know. Even identical twins, they can have different personalities. Uh, but this is where it's an interesting wrinkle. As I mentioned, one of the, the big things that we uh, monitor for is are people that are accommodating around the child, and it's usually parents, but also siblings often get involved. Like I mentioned in, in the girl that I presented earlier on, the three-year-old was talking for the seven-year-old. And, you know, these siblings might actually like this role. They feel good about themselves. It, it becomes their adopted role. And uh, sometimes part of the treatment is helping them um, let it go because they, they find like they like that role. They feel very competent and confident. And mm -hmm. so in this situation with twins, I imagine this because twins often have a, a very close relationship, either that could work against uh, you and that there could be increased accommodation and it might be that, um, you know, they always have someone that's, that's there and close to them, so it might be harder to convince them, hey, there's a good reason for you to start branching out. So they could work against you and they could accommodate around each other. Um, on the other hand, I, I imagine that it, it could also work where, you know, if one twin is willing to make that, that leap, then uh, maybe the other one will too, and so you can use that as extra incentive. Um, that's a really fascinating question. I'm sure there's not much, you know, there's no documented evidence that suggests whether being a twin is helpful or not in this situation, but uh, that's a really interesting possibility. Okay, and I'm I think this is going to be our last one. Okay, okay. comes from a school psychologist, and uh, she's currently working with a first grader who is now whispering to everyone in class. In a small group, she will only talk in full voice to some children, Great. and the question is about strategies for moving the child from whispering to full voice. Yeah, I think the most important thing is to not over-accommodate. Um, and so the great, uh, it's important not to um, uh, talk anyone into or be talked into moving the kid from uh, that class. I think that's usually the first step that parents will do or teachers will do. They'll say, oh, maybe we should move them to a smaller class or maybe we should have them in a, um, in a more protected environment. And that's when you're taking um, you know, your first step to accommodation. And what you want to do is use that situation. It seems to me like a perfect situation where there's some elements of the class where they feel more competent and others where they're more uh, handicapped. So what you want to do is um, find some ways to bridge that gap um, and so let's just imagine that in a small group happens in the morning time um, and they're talking about a certain kind of topic. Well, maybe what you want to do is that uh, you start with saying, mm, how about we do a replication of that um, or a second group in the afternoon? Uh, 
Um, so that we're going to do that, um, and so that at least the child gets practice doing talking at a normal voice, um, you know, two times during the day. Now, as long as the teacher finds that that's consistent with their academic goals, that would be great. Then, if you know, as as they get comfortable and they're doing that a, a, for a week or so, and you start to realize, oh, they're comfortable in these settings, then maybe um, repeat the topic uh, in. Um, in the general class, and so that maybe the child might be more comfortable to speak when it's about a topic that they've already spoken about. Okay, so that's something that you look for, and uh, the school counselor can be negotiating this with the teacher and see would that ever be possible. Okay, so that would require a lot of, um, I'd say, kind of um, you know accommodation in the good way on the part of the teacher, in which they're trying to find ways to actively encourage a child to speak. If that's not possible. What you might do is 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 uh, look for um, the child to speak to someone in that class uh, to that group, and then find a way for the child later on in the day to continue to talk to that student. So it continues to just generalize the situations in which they can can keep talking to that one student, um, uh, you know, and feel comfortable, but broaden the situations and contacts where they're doing that, and then work to finding another person where they can start to talk to, and then keep building up from there. Just make the group bigger as you go along. Yeah, exactly. Well, Dr. Chu, thank you very much. A lot of great information. We have um, a number of questions, a lot of questions that we never got to, so we'll take care of those on the chat board. So thank you very much, Doctor, for your presentation tonight. Sounds great. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you all for joining our webinar on selective mutism, coordinated behavioral approaches for therapists, pa parents, and schools. There is an exit survey which should show on your screen panel as you click the X um, on the screen panel. Please fill out the evaluation on the exit survey. The discussion board is will be open tomorrow and is available for the next seven days on the NJCTS website for additional questions that were no, not covered in tonight's presentation. That website is www.njcts.org. Also, an archived recording of tonight's webinar will be posted to the site. Our next presentation, Understanding and Responding to Behavioral Difficulties and Rage Behaviors in Children and Adolescents, will be presented by Dr. Sean Eubank and is scheduled for February 23, 2011. This ends tonight's webinar. Thank you, Dr. Chu, for your presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Good night.